and, and one of our findings, and it's certainly a finding that's born in the literature in all of our professions, is that isolation is, an, is really a key factor in that. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about isolation in this area or how do you get in the front door or, or you know, what do you do? Well, you know, what you bring up is an interesting point and it's kind of looking at systemic issues and around policy and practice. So policies that are well-intentioned but can have negative consequences are not looking at that ripple effect. So, yes. I mean, we have this ethos of being able to age in place, you know, aging at home strategies mm -hmm. and things, which are very good. It supports people's decisions to stay in their communities and things. But at the same time, that type of a system is predicated on the bulk of the care being provided by family members without the supports in place to, to support them in those roles. Mm -hmm. So again, I think we're setting up conditions where it sounds good on paper and it looks very good, but we're setting the conditions for abuse to occur because we're placing people who are not trained, not skilled in delivering sometimes very complex care to their family yes, members yeah. on a 24-hour basis. In an institution, people work on usually eight hour or 12 hour shifts. So at least at the end of your shift, you can go home. Mm -hmm. This is a 24 hour a day job and you don't get the training, unlike the professionals in the organizations or registered, non-registered staff, at least there is some training. Most family members don't get training in the type of care they're now delivering to people. And because we're keeping people out of institutions longer, the complexity of the care in the community is huge. Mm -hmm. And unlike an institution where people come and go, there's staff in and out all the time, family members who might notice things, you might be the only two people in the home for long periods of time. So the probability of something happening and going unnoticed, I think, is far greater than in the institutions. And for the physicians, how often might you see a person in the community? Um, in terms, if they're able to come to the clinic, come to the, to the office, that's, it's not bad. You may see them a few times a year. You may see them more frequently, um, depending on the caregiver's ability to bring them in. So transportation becomes a huge issue, access and transportation. If you're asking for physicians or nurses to visit the home, again, it depends on where they are, um, weather conditions, and whether or not there's somebody there to sort of open the door for you. So access becomes a huge issue. Many people do not have any primary care physicians, uh, primary care, and they're the gatekeepers. They're the ones that order you know, the, the home care, et cetera and if they're not there, they can't even get the ball rolling. So there, is enough, there are not enough points of access for, for the older person or the older caregiver of the older person um, to, in which to seek help and get that support that they need. Well, I don't think that we can assume uh, just that, that rural means that you're isolated. I think you can be very isolated oh, in uh, the biggest city. Mm -hmm. And I think you can be, you know, have a lot of people coming in to see you and have good relationships in a rural area, although mm -hmm. transportation is mm -hmm. still... Weather. Yeah, weather. There's all these other mm -hmm. things that interfere. Absolutely. But. but visiting in the home is one of the best things that we can do as a healthcare provider because things may sound fantastic in, in, the, you know, mm -hmm. in the outpatient clinic setting and then you get to the house and you're like, hmm, um, you know, is there any actual food in the fridge? And you know, what's, what's the state of cleanliness? And, and yeah. more subtle things may be missed um, by not going into the house.